travel mercies. Uh, we will continue to keep uh, Israel in our prayers. Uh, and you said those are the the heart zarts. 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 Together. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Prayers of Thanksgiving uh, for our 11 year old granddaughter just voted in for her school student council. Oh, very good. Oh. Awesome. Very proud of her. And I have another one too. Um, no, our friend know. Molly is going through some health issues, so prayers for strength and God's good Thank you. Um, my friend's son, Robbie, died on Sunday morning. Oh, no. Okay. How old was he? 50. Okay. Um, we'll go around. I have two as well. <coughs> <laughs> Safe travel for all of us heading to the um, St. Paul Women's Retreat in New Smyrna Beach this weekend. And also, as I'm sure all of us, um, Israel is on our hearts. You got it. <clears throat> Plus, those who are persecuted, please keep help them in all their needs. Yes, John. A trigger friend of mine, husband and wife, both have cancer. The wife has breast cancer, and the husband has testicular cancer, and they're both under treatment. Do you want to give us their what names? Name? Oh, okay. Cindy. Gail and Cindy? Robert. Gail yeah. and Robert, you got it. That's my granddaughter's name. <laughs> so maybe you're my granddaughter. No. How old I think are I'm you? too old to be that. How old are you? 72. Well, I would have had to work real fast because <laughs> I was um, Mackenzie Gleason was a former student at oh, 11 Paul. years old. Now right. my daughter's roommate and her father died yesterday morning. So, uh, Mackenzie, when he passed away? I'm sorry? Mackenzie passed away? Mackenzie's father. Father, father, father. Okay. And Barb Wagner asked for prayers for her neighbor, John, who's battling cancer. And he's apparently all alone, so they're doing whatever has to be done with him. Is that the John always comes here for senior saints? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, he's, been in, he's been in some uh, good conversation with Pastor Steve. So, um, I know he has to be baptized. Yes. Yes. I don't know how public that was, but I was I was privy to that to that piece of news as well. So um, Pastor Steve will have those conversations with him, and, and very soon, most likely, a baptism as well. So, That's cool. Yes. Um, the word does not return void. Mm -hmm. uh, right. All right. Let's go to the word. Oh, one more. Pray for our leaders in this country, and also for our military. Obviously, we, we didn't know about Israel when we were putting together the bulletin for the traditional service, but the prayers of the church were just all over it. Mm -hmm. um, and God just works in that way, praying mm -hmm. for leaders and praying for our military. They feel comfort, they feel prepared, they feel the provision of God with them. Um, mm -hmm. So, yes. Pastor Steve's reading of Joshua is pretty, uh, pretty mm -hmm. appropriate mm -hmm. in this time right now. Right. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, let's go to the, the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the blessings that we have in uh, every day. The blessings of waking up, the blessings of walking, the blessings of breathing in the fresh air that you've blessed us with, and then the blessing, of course, of living out in, the, in your vineyard uh, as the kingdom of God, as, as your servants, as your tenants of that vineyard to produce its fruit and to share that fruit with the people around us. And so, Lord, as we're here today, as we gather together, we lift up our prayers to you. Lord, we, uh, we pray you know, over many people who are traveling. Uh, Lord, that we ask for the Votenhauers that, that are in Ephesus. Lord, that you would 
continue to keep them safe in their travel. The Zarts would travel uh, over to Dubai as they were in Tel Aviv. And would you just, Lord, please uh, just let them get to safety. Keep them safe. Keep them in your care. We thank you for the care, Lord, that you have given to the seventh grade class as they have gotten to Luther Rock safely. Keep them safe while they are there. Um, that they would uh, no one would get hurt during the exercises, uh, but that they would continue to grow and strengthen their faith uh, with one and another. Lord, we also ask for safe travels for the women's retreat this weekend. Lord, may they uh, continue to, uh, to get there. Well, they will. Sorry, will you get them there safely, Lord, so that they can have fun, have time to gather into the pearls of your wisdom and your word. Um, so that they can continue to grow in their faith and in sisterly love with one and another. Lord, we also uh, pray that you be with those who are battling, uh, Lord, that are battling with cancer, with diseases, uh, with all kinds of treatments, Lord. Would you please have your hand over them, that you would show them uh, your continued mercies and grace, and so that they would be able to see you work in magical, mysterious, and miraculous ways inside their lives. Lord, we lift up uh, John's friends, Carl, uh, sorry, Gail and Robert, um, one that's struggling with breast cancer and the other one that's battling with testicular cancer, Lord, that you would just be with those doctors and their treatments, and if it be your will, to a full recovery and healing. Uh, please be with uh, Molly as she needs strength and healing from her diagnosis. Uh, be with those who are healing from the Israel attacks this uh, past weekend, Lord that you would just help the doctors take care of them, help the triage units there um, that are just trying to patch up the best that they can. Uh, please help with John, who's also battling cancer. And Lord, at the same time, we just we lift up a, a prayer of thanksgiving and praise that in this time of struggle, in this time of lack of health, um, he is residing in your strength. He is leaning into your word. He's calling upon the brothers and sisters in Christ that he's gained here at St. Paul and that he is uh, exploring what it means to be a baptized child of God. We ask, Lord, that your spirit continue to work in him and continue to grow his faith in them. In that, Lord, we also continue to just lift up all the rest of our leaders in our country and our military. Um, Lord, as we're going to be called in as for our allies uh, in the war that is to proceed most likely, um, Lord, be with our military. Uh, put a shroud of protection over all of those who serve uh, get them there safely, bring them home safely back to their families. Um, we are blessed to have those who protect our nation, that vocation of the military, uh, but those men and women who are serving have very many other vocations that we would love for them to return to. Mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, um, and many others that when they come back, they're people that are, that are longing for them to be back safely. So Lord, please be with them. Be with the people of Israel as they uh, as they plan their next steps uh, to be there. Other prayers of Thanksgiving, Lord, we lift up is for um, granddaughters, sons and daughters who are doing great things. And the granddaughter that's now in student council, uh, getting opportunities uh, to lead and to learn what it is to be a leader for her group and her peers. And so, Lord, we uh, now ask that you would take all these prayer requests, those that we mentioned out loud, and those that maybe we kept. <coughs> For ourselves and in our hearts, Lord, we lay them now before you, asking for your grace, your mercy, and your wisdom to be upon them. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, as we uh, have been talking and as we kind of uh, started up, um, we have that we're going to go through this pastoral letter to Titus. So we're going to be in Titus chapter 1. Um, and so as we're flipping there, just a little bit of a recap. Who wrote this letter? Titus. Paul, Titus. yes. And who is he writing to? Titus. Titus, great. Um, and I think we even discussed a little bit of where Titus is at. Does anyone remember where Titus is? He is yeah. in Crete. Yes, very good. Um, and so the, uh, the nation here of Crete is one of debauchery, lying, um, and a lot of mercenaries actually came out of Crete as well. Um, so their, uh, their honor code really kind of goes, whoever can pay the most is who we fight for, um, is who we believe in. And so whatever God is, it seems to be the prayers so that God is working, they follow that direction as a group. Um, whoever will pay for them to fight, then they'll fight for that that team. Um, and then, uh, but otherwise, just no integrity inside of their culture. 
um, and their own philosophers, their own native boards will bring that to light um, through this chapter as he uh, as they just open up that they are just a gluttonous lying bunch. Um, so as we go through this, especially first chapter and through the three chapters that conclude Titus, um, truth is going to be a big, big element that Paul is going to talk to Titus about. If you remain true, if you remain to the truth of the gospel, to sound doctrine, to sharing the truth, the capital T truth, which is Jesus Christ, but also the truth of the gospel, um, it's a new and fresh story that these Cretans will have not heard. Um, one, from their own culture, and two, because of their pagan beliefs for their own gods. Um, their mix of Roman and Greek gods that they would have that play tricks. Um, they deceive. And so uh, our God is a God of truth. He stands by his word. His promises are made sure. Um, are all going to be major themes uh, that Paul is going to be talking to Titus about. And so that if you are a part of this new baby young church, as he's raising up elders in this church, um, it is going to be incredibly important that you find people who are truthful. You find people who um, ascribe to the sound doctrine and who then practice and participate in that sound doc uh, doctrine, not just in church, but in their daily lives. Because that's the witness. That will be the grand witness of the elders of the church to the island of Crete is going to be how they live their day-to-day -day lives. So, without any other, any four questions, beginning questions. The only, what you said about Crete, the only the main person I can think of from Crete was Midas. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly the background. Um, touches everything as gold. Right? Yep. Uh, so and so that is uh, actually one of the examples I used on Tuesday. So thanks for bringing it up. Um, so again, if you want to use a quick example, um, I don't know how many of you guys have studied or looked into mythology, Greek, Roman, other. Um, sometimes some great stories. I'll just say that. Like also to kind of know what people believe in. Um, Norse paganism, North Norse mythology, Norse religion um, is in a huge growth actually in our military. So as we pray for our military, um, Norse paganism is a religion inside of the military that's recognized, um, and there's a lot of attraction for it. Um, two major factors for the military, a little sidetrack. Um, one, you're allowed to grow facial hair, so they can keep facial hair underneath a religious exemption if they consider themselves Norse pagans, um, and for a lot of guys, they like that. Um, the second thing is, is Norse paganism, uh, if you die in war, then you go to Valhalla, which is their form of heaven. Um, and so for people who are in the military and have, an op have the uh, very real presence of dying in battle, um, that is an automatic to heaven, uh, to, uh, to, I should say, to, to Valhalla um, in a Norse pagan culture, if to die in war. And so um, much war, uh, much victory, much conquest for the Vikings, as it would have been. Um, and so that's really trickled in, uh, talking to some of our chaplains. They, they battle with that a lot. Um, there's people coming in and saying, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking this. And, um, they can only uh, apostolize so much to them to try to steer them Christian, but otherwise they have to allow the people to pursue whatever religion they feel like is calling them. So. The Scandinavian people are very high in Christianity, though. It, yes, nowadays after after the crusade or during the crusades and also through the German lands being converted during Reformation, a lot of that's been pushed out. But there's there's a new upwelling in our military right now for it. So, um, but the Midas touch, yeah. So, uh, hey, I can make you rich. Everything you turn touch, everything you touch turns to gold. Midas thinks it's a great idea. Sounds awesome until you realize you can't touch food without it turning to gold, so you can't eat, you can't indulge in the, in the wondrous food that all your money can buy. Um, I believe it's the women that he tries to uh, have fun with, uh, touches, and immediately they turn to gold. Um, for his opinion, making love to a statue isn't very much fun. Um, uh, being married, I could imagine. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's this deceptiveness that the gods have. We, we, can, we can dingle, dangle out this, this great gift. You can touch anything, it turns to gold. Uh, but really, it's a curse because you can't have the common pleasures water, food, love. Um, everyone has to stay away from him. And so that's, what, that's their image they have of their gods. 
Uh, but our God is a good God, a gracious God, a providing God, a protecting God uh, from this weekend. And so it touches a lot more on that. Yes, Fred. The, that's a Greek area, a Hellenistic. Yep. But even going back 300 BC, the, uh, you know, after the uh, Peloponnesian War and all that with the uh, uh, Spartan and those people. Athenians. They became the Athenians, the Spartans. There's always been a real big thing about if you wanted the best troops available, you got Greek. And Greeks were for sale anywhere in the Eastern world, which would have been to uh, Babylon and beyond. Oh, yeah. If you wanted the best army around, you bought Greek. And that's what these people were. They were one of the big supporters of, uh, uh, what's the, the, oh, the big Macedonian. Alexander. 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 He used the Greek in his army a lot. Yep. So that's where you went. But they thought nothing at all of, um, you know, whatever it took. And they were very, their lifestyle was very, you know, debauchery. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. They had whole units of uh, soldiers that were nothing but uh, gay. The thought being that if you put two gay people that were in love together, they would not leave their partner to swing while they ran the other way. Mm. I did not know that. Okay. So a debaucherous group that Titus is going to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was interesting uh, when we had the uh, Lutheran Bible translators here mm -hmm. talking about the problem in Africa with the Wagner group from which we're Russian, we're from you know, the Ukraine, but Wagner, his hero was Norse, the Norse gods in Germany. Uh, okay. So all of the great operas, by the way. <laughs> but uh, but remember, Hitler loved that too. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, right before we jump in, a foreword from good old Martin Luther um, <coughs> about this epistle of Titus um, to kind of frame our mind for it. So the epistle to Titus is short, but it is kind of the epitome and summary of other wordier epistles. We should be imbued with the attitudes that are taught in it. Paul is the sort of teacher who is engaged most of all in these two topics, either teaching or exhorting. Moreover, he never exhorts in such a way that he fails to mingle didactic, that is doctrinal, instruction with him. And so while this epistle is obviously a hortatory one, Yet he writes in such a way that he superbly mingles doctrine with exhortation, and in a double measure. He is a true teacher, one who both teaches and exhorts. By his teaching he sets down what it is to be believed by faith, and by his exhortation he sets down what is to be done. Thus, by doctrine he builds up faith, by exhortation he builds up life. He begins with exhortation, yet he mingles instruction with it. Therefore, this is a hortatory epistle, yet not exclusively so. So we're gonna hear a lot of words of encouragement, and we're gonna hear a lot of instruction, um, all woven in together through the gospel message to Titus. So, 1-1, one, one, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. As we go through this, we'll see Paul's pretty normal um, salutation that he gives, um, where in the olden times, uh, they wrote letters a little bit different than we do. They write the name of the author. They describe maybe the titles or who that author is. Then it's the name of the recipient. And then it's this, the greeting, the salutation of the greeting um, is right after that. So we see Paul right at the beginning. That's not who it's written to, but who wrote it. Um, very different, whereas we go, dear John, dear Lucy, dear something, and then we sign our name at the bottom. They started with their names up at the top. Um, Paul immediately takes an opportunity to start describing who and where he came from. Um, and so, a servant of God, uh, very broad, but very upfront. Uh, he is in the service of God. This is not of his own doing. 
This is not his own station that he claims for himself, but rather as in service to God. Uh, if we jump to the Greek, and Pastor Steve has mentioned this a couple times, is we have that doulos language here. Uh, and so doulos means slave or servant. Um, so the translations here usually tend to bend towards servant. Um, but Paul would have definitely not have minded the slave terminology used to it. Um, Paul, more than anyone, knew of the slavery that was widespread across the area. And also of the, uh, you're good, it happens, uh, the slavery that is to sin. You ha you, we all have a master. And so either your master is Jesus Christ or your master is the way of the world. And so for him, he wants his master to be Christ. He has given his life full out for the, for the gospel and for Jesus. And so Paul and others so uh, frequently use this term in a positivity, uh, this, this excitement towards the servanthood they have of God or this enslavement they have to the gospel um, because the other is sin and they know what that life looked like and they don't want any part of it. They don't want any part of being enslaved to sin and the powers of the devil and temptation. Fred, question? Yeah, what, what language would this have been written in? Greek. It's Greek, okay. Yep. Yep, our earliest text come in Greek. So um, this would have been, uh, I guess we can jump to that real quick. Um, Titus is of Greek origin. So he is, uh, he is a full-on Gentile. Um, and so we'll touch a little bit on that later as we, we talk about him being set here. Um, I don't want to spoil something that I got planned for later. Um, surprise. Surprise. Uh, but, you know, so the power of sin is part of there. And so all people are enslaved to something uh, with and without choice. But once you're redeemed, uh, we, get to be, we get to be called servants of God, slaves to God, slaves to the gospel. Um, again, that kind of goes into Luther, Luther's even doctrine of the, the bondage of the will. So our will is to do what's selfish. And so uh, through Christ, that sinful will inside of us is bound up. And so the only willingness that we have then is to follow Christ and to do what Christ asked us to do. And so that's in service to him, the fruit of the Spirit then, um, and living out his appointment in our lives as, uh, as the Lord over and in our lives. Any questions so far? Okay. So then we go into an apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's elect. So God's elect, uh, don't get too caught up in the Calvinistic side of this where we can say, you know, double election and double predestination. Um, this is just saying God's chosen people. This is a very natural term for them. It was Israel. It was the Hebrews. Um, but as we've been hearing about parable time and time again the last three weeks, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. And will be given to these, uh, the Gentiles, the prostitutes, tax collectors, uh, who have repented and have seen the Messiah, have called upon Christ himself, and are now part of God's elect. Um, and so there's a call to this, but there's a call also to the apostleship that Paul has. Um, it's not as big, uh, reading through some of these different pe uh, pieces and, and what people have wrote, wrote in, written in scholarship. Um, there's not too much of an argument towards Paul's apostleship for Crete. Um, Titus worked with Paul, so he knew who Paul was. He knew the teaching and the knowledge that was imparted upon him uh, through that, that, that meeting from Saul to Paul on Damascus Road. Um, and so uh, he doesn't have questions too much on that, but there still is that lingering for those who this would have then been read to afterwards. A lot of the Jewish uh, tradition that would have been in that area still, um, and even some of the Jews that would have converted to Christianity. All right, we know we know who Paul really is. He was Saul. He was a Pharisee. How is he an apostle? Um, well, no, it's you know that apostleship came from Jesus Christ. It's not self-acclaimed. Uh, again, giving giving honor and all the glory to Jesus who called him into the faith um, to be part of this elect. So this whole group of elect. Their knowledge of the truth, again, here we have it in the first verse, truth. The truth has to be big and talked about. Um, this is still in that same time frame where Gnosticism was coming up, false teachers uh, bringing up their ideas of what Christianity could be or what a new sacrificial system could be for their own greed, their own self-benefit. Um, and so truth is going to be big and sound doctrine is going to be big. 
which of course with all of this then leads to godliness. Um, a way that I break this down and I have for um, in different youth times is God-likeness. So not to make us like God, but God-likeness. And so how, what is that? Uh, that's leading and living a moral, um, a moral life and walking in the path of Jesus. That's God-likeness. So that godliness that is the idea here is to have that uh, living in the faith, living out your faith in your day-to-day -day lives as well. All right, so far so good. In the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie, here we see it again, just point out blank. This is not a deceptive God. This isn't a back and forth God. This is God who does not lie, as promised before the beginning of time. Um, we talked about it a little bit last week, but Paul, being from that Pharisee tradition, um, he knew the scriptures incredibly well, especially the Old Testament. Um, the Torah, the prophets, um, he would have known them front and back, probably had the majority of them memorized, if not all of them memorized. And so uh, he knows the promises that were from the beginning for the eternal life, the promises of Genesis, the promises to Abraham in the covenant, the promises um, that were, keep, or were, were brought back to the Jewish people time and time again as the prophets came in proclaiming the kingdom of God. Um, unfortunately, too often they had to proclaim judgment, but also the promises for the provision and protection that God would have in their lives if they just followed him and listened to Yahweh. And so he's bringing this back to life that God hasn't changed. Our God doesn't change. His mind doesn't change. He loves you. He has always had a plan to send his son for you. The Messiah has now come. Let us all worship and be part of God's new kingdom through the Messiah. Verse 3, in which now at his appointed season, he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our Savior. Um, we haven't quite gotten to the time yet where there would be too much discussion um, and, uh, and trying to fight for um, adoptionism as you would have where Jesus was really just man, but then was adopted kind of like the Aryan controversy. Uh, does that ring a bell for anyone? Uh, Jesus not being God, but being adopted into lordship. All right, we'll, we'll jump into it then. Uh, but there was definitely downplay here uh, from Jewish tradition uh, who had come into Christianity or was working their way into Christianity, but weren't fully believing everything that Jesus was Lord of all was the triune God uh, and so here a lot of commentators tag that God our Savior that Savior is a big word we use for Christ but also God is the word that's being used because they're he's making the connection together it is both both our Savior and Messiah but he also is that one true God um, so that whole Trinity aspect is already being taught here um, Brought to light is another truthful term. Um, and then the preaching entrusted to me. And so again, he's recognizing responsibilities he has, that he's been working with Titus for quite a bit of time. And so it's been entrusted to him. And now he is now entrusting it to Titus as he goes further on. Verse four, to Titus, my true son in our common faith. Um, does anyone have a different salutation for Titus? I, there were some cool ones um, the different translations. So, to Titus, my true son. My true child. My true child, okay. Anyone else? Is that what it all says for you guys? Um, so, the big push here is um, that this is Paul um, truthfully claiming Titus. I mean, he's claiming Titus as his, um, as his student, as his brother uh, in the faith. Um, but because he kind of was the overseer over Titus, it's not necessarily brother and sister as much as it is son to, to mentor, to, to spiritual father. Um, commentator writes, Paul greets Titus in language similar to this address in Timothy, uh, the true spiritual son, his beloved son, uh, meaning that it's, there's a legitimacy here. There's a, he learned what he is teaching you from me. He's one step, you know, one step removed from the apostleship, uh, but is being set and has been trained up in the faith by Paul. And so, again, very endearing of Paul uh, to write it this way. It's not just to, to Titus, a fellow believer, 
uh, but Titus, my son, my beloved one, uh, my child, who I have raised in our common faith. We believe the same things, we've been taught the same thing, or I've taught you the same things that I believe that I learned from God, um, and now we're going to go out into the world. And then we have the salutation, a short one, but to the point, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. Any questions on our greeting? Nope. Right. So we pick it up in verse 5. Um, I, I do like uh, uh, headings on stuff because it gives you an idea of what is to come. Uh, but remember that this is a letter. It would have all just been written out. Um, scholarship has broken it up into verses and chapters and to headings um, later on. Um, note to also self... Um, this was originally written to Titus, but would have been passed out to the church. So we're not going to see too many personal things in here, um, whereas we would in 2 Timothy that was written really just for Timothy um, to take in and to receive um, that information. But here in Titus, um, first for Titus to do the work he had, but as he was building the church, all right, pass this out. You're, you're sharing this letter that this is the mission that we are all on together, um, even though it was originally addressed to Titus. So, uh, verse 5, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So, a reminder, hey, this is the mission. This is what you are to do. Um, commentators write that this is not necessarily a, um, you haven't been doing this, so you better get doing this, but rather, hey, this is the mission. We still got to keep doing this. We got to keep moving forward. Uh, it's going to be a tough grind uh, because if you got a lot of mercenaries, you got a lot of people who are in and out, you got a lot of people who um, will switch alliances for whoever pays best, and you also have a lot of people who are pretty strong then. If you're willing to fight and you're going to be a fighter, um, strong in body, strong in mind, strong will, um, and you got to you got to find a way to get to the heart of this and break that. You're going to break the paganism that's in this uh, nation and to share the gospel and how you're going to reach the gospel on what could have been a lot of hard hearts at the time. Uh, so he knows the work that's set there. It's unfinished, but it's time to get to it. Um, continue doing as you've been taught, as you've been directed. Then we start getting an idea of what these elders are to look like. An elder must be blameless. Faithful to his wife. I know the translations, I believe, even say faithful to one wife. Yep, to one wife. Um, this this shocks me a little bit um, as I read this because we are going through, um, just finished Genesis at over in the school with the sixth grade class um, where Jacob had four wives. David, we know, had five wives. I mean, they're, and I don't even think Jacob really had four wives, two wives to fun mates, um, <laughs> as I've decided to, to coin them. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, I think the kids are, you know, giggling and laughing. It just doesn't make, that's something we don't recognize in our culture. And so, um, haven't done enough time to get the research into it, but when is that shift that we really start coming back to, hey, enough of this multiple wife thing and extracurricular activities with other women of uh, lower status, uh, you know, maid servants and things like that. Um, but one wife being faithful in that marriage bond that you have, um, not stepping out of it, but faithful to the one wife that you've been blessed with. Um, also, uh, Greeks, as we know, debauchery all over. Um, no, not much faithfulness, and uh, definitely sometimes uh, the swinging nature in that as well. Um, and so uh, this is a big push that he's going to have, is to say, hey, we're going to break the culture. We're going to have family units. We're going to protect those family units. You're going to be a man to one wife. And then uh, as we continue right next, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. <laughs> okay. That's a, that's, a, that's a long list. Um, a little personal joke and also a, a past. Uh, this verse, uh, I think it was actually the, the one in Timothy where it said that um, children who behave and, and are kept in order or an orderly household uh, was brought to me when I was younger. My dad brought it before me because uh, <laughs> we were at, I was at the private school and ended up in the principal's office more times than I ought. Uh, <laughs> and and he, just, he just had one of those real moments. He just said, son, um, I'm being called to ministry. I know I am, but you're making it incredibly hard sometimes. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
because people, uh, you know, this is they they see a reflection of me through your behavior, uh, and uh, it was I was I was kind of met with it. Like, all right, I, my actions aren't just my own. You know, you, you don't. As a child, we don't always realize how our actions work upwards. We expect always actions to act downward, you know? Right. The teacher get yelled at, she has a bad day, then we get extra homework, you know? It, it kind of trickles down that way. Um, but there's, there's an upswing to it, an upwelling to it as well. Um, and so there's a responsibility of elders to have their households in order, to have their kids being raised in the faith. Um, it's, it's very, very important. John, yes? My father had limited education, had extra education, and he didn't learn anything any until he went to school because he was raised in the Ukrainian household. And my grandma didn't speak in English. But my father said, You go to school, and the school is not calling him. The school will not call him. And I had to call him school. Not in the ministry, but you know, I drove from my house. I know who would be right for me to know. You make a fool, I don't have a fool. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, my parents, I don't want to get that. But my, my parents believed, my parents believed in, in, in capital punishment. Um, <laughs> for, for, for any crimes committed. Um, <laughs> yes, Fred. How did that work out for David? For who? For David? David. Uh, David. Yeah, no, he, he had a very tough time, um, but he also... Absalom, one of his pride and joys. Oh. Uh-huh. And how about Solomon? Oh, yep. Yep. I, I think the uh, the marriage retreat had a great little... I think it was the marriage retreat had a great little saying about when Bathsheba entered the scene. Uh, you know, he, he again, it was, one, it was one quick sin that led to a whole slew of other terrible sins. Um, and at the end of it, it still messed up the household. I mean, that there was there was an ongoing angst with the rest of the wives that Bathsheba continued to be lavish on. Um, Neither one of those went to heaven. Neither what? Neither one. Neither Absalom, his son, mm-hmm. or Solomon, his son, went to heaven. I thought you were saying neither David nor the no, 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 no. Bathsheba. <laughs> I was like, no, no, no. Like, okay, that's <laughs> news. <laughs> <laughs> really. Um, Okay. They got really quiet there for a moment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's it. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so we have we have households that need to be uh, kept in order. Uh, I, I want I just want to read this because I think it's um, very pointed, um, but it is uh, it, it just is pointed. I'm just gonna say that very clearly. Uh, and so just listen to it, hear it, um, but it don't don't let it over convict what it's not supposed to. Uh, but there is some some poignancy to this that uh, Chrysostom, uh, which was an early church father, wrote in one of his sermons. And so he writes this: We should observe what care Paul bestows upon children. For he who cannot be the instructor of his own children, how should he be the teacher of others? If he cannot keep in order those whom he has had with him from the beginning whom he has brought up and over whom he has had power both by laws and by nature, how will he be able to benefit those without? But if occupied in the pursuit of wealth, he has made his children a secondary concern and not bestowed much care on them, even so he is unworthy. For if when nature prompted, he was so void of affection or so senseless that he thought more of his wealth than of the children, how should he be raised in the Episcopal throne and so great rule? For if he was unable to restrain them in a great proof of his weakness, or sorry, restrain them, it is a great proof of his weakness. And if he was unconcerned, his want of affection is much to be blamed. He then that neglected his own children. How shall he take care of other men? Um, I think that those that saying goes across all borders of the Christian household, from lay leadership to average attender to pastors. Obviously, this is written to elders, um, but to pastors as well. Um, real quick, uh, we we as pastors, and one thing that I am learning and appreciate by some of my mentors in the ministry right now, um, we have to make sure that we keep our families a priority. 
Um, ministry is great, and it's awesome to, to pour your heart out into ministry. Um, but there hopefully is other people to help continue ministry. Um, but when there are kids in the picture, they only have one father. And so um, I'll say as a as a more of a, a thanks, I love seeing how you guys um, appreciate Pastor Steve and you allow him to spend time with his family. And you appreciate that he does spend time with his family. Um, that's huge. Um, there's other churches out there uh, that I'll just be honest. Uh, they took my dad four or five nights out of the week for meetings. Um, and he, he worked his butt off and he was at almost every game. He didn't miss much, but he had to leave right after to get to a, get to a meeting. Um, and it was it was tough sometimes. We didn't get to see him at night. So I just want to say thank you that you guys make sure that he can cover a vocation that is very important to the multiplicity that those kids then are going to go bless. Yeah. John, you're the first one. What you said about your dad, I see a huge change in attitudes. When I was in school, if I got in trouble, it was a lot worse at home. Yeah. 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 Now oh, yes. it seems like the parents say, "What's wrong with the teacher school?" Yeah. 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 You know, my kid wouldn't do anything wrong. No, no my dad took the took the word of the teacher every time. I, you know, I, I gave home to it. Yeah, my mom started saying, she said, "Quit calling me, call his father." Um, but he was, he was out on calls with the, the pastoral ministry stuff, and so she'd get the call most times. She said, "No, you don't call me when it comes to Jacob. <laughs> Unless he's sick, he's in trouble." Um, yeah, it was good. Another. Uh, the term overseer in my Bible has a footnote saying bishop. And yes. bishop is a preacher. And so this is one that's talking to you preachers. It's talking to both. Um, bishops were also appointed uh, as elders and as leaders as well, uh, especially in the early church because there wasn't, uh, there wasn't a formal education process yet. And so, uh, as you did, there's there's multiplicity of terms that are used in this, but this really is talking. There's already, if you want to go completely Catholic in that sense, um, or Catholic rather, um, Titus is the priest, and so he's being he's being told what to do for the elders underneath and the bishops that will be then in charge of the maybe the smaller house churches, but are still part of the church. Um, so you can, you can use whatever word you want, but it really is for the eldership, for who you're going to raise up underneath the priest, uh, who would then be Titus in this place. Yes? What you read about about a man who cannot, if you have a child who is undisciplined, not undisciplined, but just wild and disobedient? Yes, disobedient. Uh, then the, man, the father should not be allowed to teach others because of how can you teach others if you can't teach them? Mm -hmm. Well, how do you square that up with a kid that just ain't going to listen to you? He's just totally wild and totally off the wall. And no matter, you know that this is a good man mm -hmm. and you would trust him with your own kids, but their own is a real problem. Yeah, I mean, that's that's where this this gets really dicey, is saying, so what, what level, of, and again, there's a point where I would totally believe there's an age of accountability for the child at some point. You know, at 18, you know, you, you've, you've taught in the faith and everything's there and they go off to college and they come back with these all, like, you know, do we give up? No, we keep constantly trying to reinstill those those life patterns in, but a, a 25, 26 year old who's doing their own thing and, and their own debauchery, that's, that's no longer, I mean, that's their own decision that they've done. But I think that a lot of what's being talked here is the smaller family household when you have young children that are, uh, just you're not you're not again there's a neglect aspect to this especially and so it's a yeah there's a balance of knowing the person and knowing the home life um that would be part of what they would be deciding into eldership and i know that many pastors take that into account even with the elders that are um in play in churches because they recognize that there's there's some kids who just want to do their own thing and it's not for lack of trying it's not for lack of love it's not for lack of christian instruction um they just they have an unruly spirit of you. Uh, Fred. The prodigal son. Yep. The, yeah. Keep praying, keep lavishing love and grace. Yeah. Yep. And he did come back. Yep. He did. What son? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Just a anecdote. My first two children, my, my daughter was born first. Mm -hmm. And she was your 
prototypical strong-willed child. Mm. If I told her no, you know, she's trying to touch the socket, and I tell her no, she'd turn and she'd look at me and touch it. And I thought, what am I doing wrong? But then I had my second child, and he was obedient. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was the same parents. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> children, excuse me, will listen to someone else before they listen to their parents, okay. and that seems to be very prevalent today. Mm -hmm. I, I actually was talking to a parent just yesterday, and um, they just kind of said, you know, they're so thankful for St. Paul to have people that are speaking in their kids' lives because they're coming back with like I, you know, those thoughts like, Dad, I heard this today, so I'm, I'm start doing this. And he goes. I've been telling you that for five years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, Why are you listening to me? From somebody else. But oh, he did. He's more receptive to that. Absolutely. Um, Go and, figure. And so I think that that is, I mean, that is, I shouldn't say it's not, it's definitely not the number one, but it is in the top five benefits of the church. Being in and involved with the body of Christ, to have other parents, to have other people who are investing and, uh, and helping in that community. So that they hear the same messages over and over. So when mom and dad get too rote in their mind and in their ears, someone else gets a chance to say the exact same message and it just hears different. But that's why the kids listen to teachers sometimes before they listen to their parents. I, I think sometimes that too. And that's sad because it's what some of them are teaching today. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's not mm -hmm. always great. I think the other thing is peer peer groups. Mm -hmm. yes. it, it, uh, it makes a huge difference if you're in a long group or the right group. Yep. As iron sharpens iron. Yep. Um, monitoring, and that's something that um, I've talked to in the past with youth parents is monitor who your kids are hanging out with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The influences that they have um, when they're away. Because that's that's when the devil comes to town and they want someone who's got some reasonable brains around to say, yeah, we should have done that, or we should not do that, rather, you know, and uh, it's stopped as one of them, to, you know, keep everyone in check. So, um, definitely would agree. Let's jump into verse 7. We got this new word, overseer, um, but scholarship would say that this is interchangeable back and forth again. Um, you are overseeing the other Christians underneath you. You are an elder amongst them. Uh, since an overseer manages God's household, so again, these elders are managing the people that are in the church, God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain, a lot of other translations say greed. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. All right, two verses there. What are your takeaways? What are some of your your thoughts as Paul gives these five vices and seven virtues of what an elder is and what an well, well, yeah, elder overseer is? Yes. Yep. Well, I don't think we can disagree with any of those things. I thought you were gonna have a great statement. I thought you were throwing it down. Be like, yeah, it makes sense now. Tuesday's group had had some some finer points to the uh, to the idea that just uh, the list is big. It's long. Uh, and I know for me, while um, this is pretty, it's supposed to be pretty neutral as he's looking for new elders, um, it's very convicting for me, uh, myself. Just, okay, uh, you know, I, I'm a pretty hospitable person. Um, that part's not so hard, but uh, not quick tempered. Oof. <laughs> Oof. Uh, uh, a pastime, yeah. Uh, something that I have to keep in check. I have to, you know, for the spirit, be self controlled. I have to. Otherwise, I, I've seen where my tongue wants to run faster than my brain, uh, and, and where I should, what I should not say. Um, not overbearing, you know. There's, there are times, uh, and so to see that list and to see what the, uh, if you want to say the qualifications are, 
it's it can sometimes be very convicting but there's always more that we can do i'm not sure to lose their balance no well and there you go <laughs> you boy, just drink and he can lose his temper <laughs> yep. um and, and so and and there we go and there we step into the grace mm-hmm. the grace that is for it all that there again, <clears throat> here's the benchmarks you know here is here is the, the, the what we strive for every day. Um, the the group of men also said that um, this is you know they really felt convicted that this isn't just for elders, but this is the Christian witness. This is for the lady. This is for this is what it means to be a Christ follower. Uh, because if you're not a elder inside of a church, you're still an elder in your home. You're an elder, and you're, you can be an elder to your community, an overseer, a witness to the people that you're around in your job. Uh, and so all of these traits, all of these things that are being brought up here um, are, are qualifications and for and kind of goals of every church person, of every Christ follower. Um, and so we should, we should try to strive for that. So women included. Women included. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We uh we were jumping around Genesis again and got into Exodus and there were some questions that kind of came up. I was like, well, what about the women? What about the women? And I, I just had to play this and I was like, in that time, women had a different role, you know, and, and they they had a good laugh about it. But yeah, this especially in our day to day, uh, where women are in business, women are out leading, um, in so many different wonderful things. Um it's for everyone. This is not this is not just a men's chapter for sure. All right, we'll finish up with verse nine, and then we'll pick up the rest of it next week. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Again, we get this touch point of um, trustworthy. The trustworthy message, the true message of Christ, uh, must be taught, must be shared, must be proclaimed. Uh, encourage others by using sound doctrine, and you can't be, I don't want to, humble not the right word, but you can't be too meek that you're not going to oppose when it's wrong. I think that um, in our church today, we do pretty good about staying to the trustworthy message that's been taught. We encourage people. Uh, I'm not sure we always do the right or do the best in refuting with love the opposition. You know, we got lavish love and grace, um, but we can sometimes let the gray area, we allow things that are black try to be gray. And so um, the encouragement here, I think, of Paul is that you know, there is there is a time, there is a place, and through love and grace, it, we gotta stay here for what's true. And be bold. Be bold with what's true. Because that again, all part of our witness to the world around us. Um, I think that we are back in a culture again of people who are trying to find and discern truth. They're out, they're asking questions. Um, there's just there's so much misinformation and misguidance and temptation. Um, we're confusing what is up and what is down, and we are confusing what used to be simple answers. And so, uh, truth is going to become very important um, to this next generation that comes in and doesn't doesn't know. I mean, just pure and simple doesn't know much. Okay. What that free environment. Yep. Mm-hmm. This is what caused a lot of trouble. Oh, yes. Oh, no. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And at the same time, while this can cause a lot of trouble, I also have 80,000 pages of commentaries in here. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, and it and, and just, and million and a couple thousand different translations of the Bible. I mean, same thing for the you have on your phone. I just, um, I, I did a sermon once, we did a series, and I got to preach one of the sermons of the series, Technology for Good, uh, and how can we use our technology to further the gospel? Uh, it's possible. Hello again, shout out to the people online, uh, you know, people watching later. Uh, technology at work for the kingdom of God. Uh, we're not going to get rid of technology, you know. Love the Amish, they, you know, they have their own beliefs and 
practices of hiding from technology as the as the root of all sin? No. But how can we wage technology to further the gospel? How can we make that encouraging post on Facebook? How can we not share that false doctrine that someone else is, is spewing? How can we keep God's word at our fingertips because our phones are already there? How can we keep God's message, his word, music in our cars and around us on our kids' phones so that it's fun for them to listen to? Um, is awesome, awesome, pretty big stuff that we can continue to do. So. All right, I'll leave you guys with that and a cliffhanger to finish out chapter one and go into chapter two next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.